Good morning. Again, so glad y'all made it. Ooh. Um, can you turn me down just a little bit? <clears throat> a little too much for me. All right, guys. Again, a lot of people sick. In today's world, everybody has COVID, right? Um, and traveling, but seriously, so glad you're here. We're in 11, John 11, and we're going to start with verse 45. And look, y'all, this might be the biggest section we've ever done, 45 through 57. I got two hours to do it. Y'all ready? I'm kidding. But, so just get ready to go there. So last week I talked about, uh, before you put that up there, last week I talked about, I confessed to you that I like the UFC, Right? And I'll even go further to say my favorite UFC guy is Conor McGregor, which is probably the biggest heathen in the world um, by his own admission. But, you know, I, I talked about how when Jesus came to the tomb of Lazarus, you know, it's like, you know, Bruce Buffer saying, you know, ladies and gentlemen, this is the co-main event of the evening. You know, I can hear him saying that because he, Jesus walks up to death face to face with this grave, this tomb. And he's about to duke it out here, right? See, who, who has the power, death or Christ? And I was just thinking when reading this, because what happens is the same thing that happens if you watched uh, Conor McGregor's last fight with Dustin Poirier. Did anybody watch that? I did. You watched it? I know you watched it. Uh, some of you, because we're all from Louisiana, were for Dustin. I was for Conor. Uh, so we all just imagine, we all come to this ring, we all come to somebody's house, we all turn on the TV, we're all watching it. We're all rooting for one or the other, right? We're watching the same event. But when you leave, some are happy and some are not, right? And this is what happens in this story with Lazarus when Jesus raised him from, from the dead. I mean, it's crazy that some people leave there happy and some people are angry about this whole situation. And it's mind-boggling when you really think about it, how somebody could be mad at this situation as us believers look at it, you know? But I want to kind of break that down, and hopefully it'll make a little bit more sense. So, I'm going to read you this chapter, then we'll break it down. Well, not this chapter, but verses 45 through 57. Many of the Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary and had seen what he did, believed in him. But some of them went to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done. So the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered the council and said, What are we to do? For this man performs many signs. If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him. And the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. But one of them, Caiaphas, who was high priest that year, said to, to him, You know nothing at all, nor do you understand that it's better for you that one should die for the people, not that the whole nation should perish. He didn't say this of his own accord, but... Being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the nation. And not for the nation only, but also to gather into the children of God who were scattered abroad. So from that day on, they made plans to put him to death. Jesus, therefore, no longer walked openly among the Jews, but went from there to the region near the wilderness, to a town called Ephraim. And there he stayed with his disciples. Now the Passover of the Jews was at hand. And many went up from the country to Jerusalem before the Passover to purify themselves. They were looking for Jesus and saying to one another as they stood in the temple, What do you think? That he will come to the feast at all? Now the chief priests and the Pharisees had given orders that if anyone knew where he was, he should let them know so they might arrest him. Let's pray. Father God, thank you so much for this day, Father, for us to be able to gather here together to hear your word, Father. And uh, Lord, I pray that is our prayer today, that we hear and we believe your word because at the end of the day, that's what we have to do, God. And so I pray for the people who are traveling today from our congregation, who are, who are gone, who are sick uh, and they're with their families. I pray you heal them, Father God. I pray you be with all the other churches around here that are preaching your word. I pray you open hearts and eyes. And God, I pray you open my heart and eyes and use me this morning. It's in Christ's name. Amen. So, for your benefit, every one of you, I'm going to ask Jeremy Labor to plug in the clock. 
because I might lose time. So look here. Chapter 11, verse 45 and 46. Let's see what it says. Many of the Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary and had seen what he did, believed in him. But some of them went to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done. So imagine. So it says, you know, he puts Mary in here for a reason. He could have put Martha. He could have put nobody. He could have just said, you know, some of them believed. And this is what's neat when you're reading the Bible and you just see these little words here and there, and you ask, like, why? Why? What's the point, right? Like a frame. I spent a day on wondering what, what's a frame? Where's that place? What's that have to do with anything? You know, but he says, Mary, these people who came with Mary, when you study Mary, man, she's the one that sat at Jesus' feet. She's the one that, that listened, wanted to hear about him, right? And so I imagine these people come from Jerusalem to be there and mourn and, and show compassion for this family. I just see Mary telling them all about Jesus, all the things he had done. You know, one of my favorite passages in Scripture is at the end of John where it says he did many other signs. If, if, if we wrote down everything he did, there would not be enough books in the world to contain it, right? It's pretty cool. So imagine what all the things that Mary has seen up to this point. And imagine when she sends people to go to Jesus and he waits two days, four days, he finally shows up. Imagine all the stories that she had told these people about Jesus and just her hope, how much confidence she had. Can you get that bottled water back there? Um, All the confidence she had in Jesus. And so all of a sudden, he shows up, and they're like, this is him. And then they see this man, Jesus Christ, perform this miracle, raising a dead man, and they believed, which seems to be, you know, very reasonable. Uh, Thank you. Seems very reasonable to us, right, That, that you see somebody raised from the dead, and you think, duh, I'd have believed, right? I mean, this is how we read the Bible, right? We're always the good guys. Like, if I was in the garden, I wouldn't have eaten that fruit. <laughs> Idiots. No, yeah, yeah, you would. And we just think, man, it's crazy. How could they not believe? Of course they would believe, regardless of what Mary said. But Mary invited them. She sent word that her brother was sick. And she told them about this Jesus who she'd already called for. And they're listening to these stories, and Jesus comes, and he does this. And it adds up. What she said about Christ adds up to what they see. And many believe. And so look, here's the takeaway from this. Tell people about Jesus. Invite them in your life around your other brothers and sisters in Christ so they can see that Jesus truly does change people's lives. You know what I'm saying? And I think many will believe. But don't get down on yourself, right? Because sometimes, right, man, I should have said this. I should have said that. If I'd have done this, then they would have believed. No. No, they wouldn't have. Because many did. But look at the rest of that verse here. But some of them, some of them went to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done. Now, a couple things to think about here. Like they, they know what's going on here. I mean, it was, just, it was just four days ago they were wanting to stone Jesus at the temple, right? They know what's going on. And do you think they went to the Pharisees and said, now look guys, I mean seriously, he's really good dude. No, they went to entice him to turn up the heat a little bit. They, they wanted some drama. They wanted to see something go down, right? And I know we don't know anybody like that in our lives that just wants to stir trouble and entice. But this is what happens. So it doesn't matter what you say or what you do. You do what you're called to do. Tell people about Christ. Invite them. Some will believe. Some won't. But you wonder why, how, how could they not believe, right? They just see that they, these people who do, do not believe that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. They really do not believe He's the Messiah. He just spoke to a tomb and called a man's name out to come, and the guy gets up and comes. And they walk away to go stir some trouble with this because they don't believe Him. So I'm going to give you a quote from J.C. Rom. I think I have it up here. Do I not? J.C. Rom quote, it says this, there's, there's no greater mistake than to suppose that seeing miracles will necessarily convert souls. This is a plain text for it right here. I, you, you ever heard people say, man, if I just saw this, I'd believe? No, you wouldn't. No, you wouldn't. We always think we're better than we are. Y'all, why? So what is it? If, if miracles won't do it, if watching a dead man come from the grave, how could they not? I mean, really, I mean, this should be honest with ourselves. I have a hard time. I, 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 I would think, but no. We had to believe God's word. 
So why do they not believe? Really, at the end of the day, what is it? Check out this. Leviticus, I mean, I'm sorry, Luke 16, verse 31. I think I have it up here. Here's what Jesus says. He said to them, this is in a parable. If you do not hear, this is the rich man, Lazarus, you know? It's when the rich man's like, just send Lazarus back from the dead and tell them, and then they'll believe. He says, no, see, if they don't hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced if someone should rise from the dead. See, we have a hard time believing that. I I guarantee you, when Jesus is telling them this parable, and He says this, they're probably thinking, dude, you're crazy. I promise you, man. You, okay, let me tell you something. You show me a dead man come from the grave, I promise I'll believe. Jesus like, no. no. I'm telling you, see, if they don't hear Moses and the prophets, but time out. See, let's slow down. They don't hear Moses and the prophets. They don't hear it. Like, they don't understand it. Oh, you can read it all day long. You, you people might be able to quote him all day long. You might be able to quote your scriptures, memorize the verses, but if you don't hear it, understand what it's actually telling you. Remember last week we talked about, do you really believe what you say you believe? I don't think most of us do. I know I didn't for years. I didn't for years because I didn't understand it. And if you don't understand, if you don't hear what Moses the prophet, ain't going to happen. Because let me tell you something. There's two options when it comes to Jesus Christ. you got two options. You either believe or you don't. That's it. That there's no neutral, there's no standing on the fence here. You either believe or you don't. And the only thing that is going to convert a man is the Word of God. The Word of God, this right here, right? And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. That's Jesus. So Jesus and His Word. This is the only thing that's going to do it. The only thing, well, here's what it's going to take. It's not going to be take, let me show you a miracle. And this is what, it's very, we got, we got churches that do miracles all the time, right? But they're never doing miracles. They're just playing mind games and emotional manipulation on people. I mean, why didn't... Like, you know, we, we got people writing books about, oh, I died, I went to heaven, right? We got tons of them. I died, I went to heaven, this is what it's like. They get the check from the publisher, they're good. Make a movie, good. And then finally, a smart guy was like, man, everybody went to heaven. I'm going to write one about going to hell. And so he writes a book that he went to hell, and it's so bad, you know? And everybody wants to read it. Do you realize? Here's Lazarus. Do you really believe he went? Like, we believe they went to heaven. Do you really believe he went somewhere, right? I'm assuming heaven. Do you realize after this, you read nothing about what he experienced in those three days, those four days that he was dead? Nothing. You go to Corinthians, you read about Paul, where he was called up in heaven. He said, can't speak about it. Can't speak about it. But yet here we are, us good old American Christians, and we just eat it up. Because we would rather believe fantasy than reality and just say, let me believe God's Word. Not Billy Joe's Word, who said his four-year-old died, went to heaven, and this is what it's like. Y'all, it's just unscriptural. It just is. When Paul the Apostle, who wrote three-fourths of the New Testament, said, I can't talk about it. I doubt these other people should be talking about it, or really talking about it. Lazarus? Not one word. Not one word. And if God wants us to know about it, I think He would have told us about it. Tread lightly when it comes to that stuff. So here's the deal. Go to verse 47. So they go to these Pharisees and they tell them what what Jesus did. And so the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered the council and said, what are we to do? This man performs many signs. I wish I could like go right there in the story and just say, look, I, I don't know, maybe believe in Him? Maybe... Maybe that? What do you mean, what should you do? What should you do? For he performs many signs. Check this out. If raising a dead man from life and them seeing it with their own eyes does not convince them that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, the the Messiah that they're looking for, he says, what should we do? This man performs many signs. Think about this, y'all. Today, in today's world, these atheists, right? Atheists out there don't believe in God. And so they claim that all the miracles in the Bible were fake. I mean, they're, they're just, they're misunderstood. They're not really told right. It's, it's a, it wasn't really that way, you know? Because that's not possible. 
let's just, let's just be honest with ourselves. Here is Jesus' arch enemies. They hate Him, but yet they don't deny His miracles. They don't deny it. They're not, I mean, they were there. They were witnessing these things. They saw Him raise a dead man. They saw Him heal a blind man and a lame man and all these things. They're, I mean, they even questioned. Remember the blind guy? They went, they got his mom and daddy. I mean, it got so immature. Like, where's your mom and daddy? You know, and they interviewed them. Like, they wanted, yeah, your mom and they went and talked to your mom and them. And so, but they wanted, they wanted, they would love to have proven that this stuff wasn't real. But the people who walked with Jesus and who his enemies, they even acknowledged his miracles. And so here's what we have in apologetics, and, and I don't want to get too far off on this, but there's four types of apologetics. And some people, like, we, we, we want to argue with atheists, you know? I had this conversation with somebody in my house the other day. I'm like, I love studying with atheists. I love it. Because they're expecting this argument, this debate go back and forth, you know? And they're like, I don't believe in Jesus. I don't believe in this. I don't believe that. I'm like, I just laugh. I'm like, I know, man. It's crazy. And they're like, what do you mean? I'm like, I mean, think about it. God coming to be a man? It's crazy. Wait, I got, you. I got you one even better. Here's what's really wild. Born of a virgin? Come on. That's crazy. And they're like, yeah. I mean, a dead man raised? Like, come on. Like, that, that stuff don't happen, right? And like, that's my point. It don't happen. I'm like, yeah, but see, the problem is, I believe it. It did. It did happen. See, it's just, I'm not going to argue with them. Because I could show them a dead man coming from the grave. They ain't going to believe it. It doesn't matter. And so we try to use all these big fancy words and these arguments. But here's the, here's the I, I would say, I would suggest that the, the type of apologetics that you should use is called a presuppositional approach. It means, I'm just going to share you the Word of God. And people say, well, that, you can't do that because then they don't believe the Word. But you understand, I don't, I don't care. Because only the Word of God is going to change somebody's heart. Ezekiel 36, here's what it's going to take. God, to rip your heart of stone out, put a heart of flesh in, put His Spirit in you that causes you to obey Him. That's Ezekiel 36. That's what it takes. Not a convincing argument. Not raising a dead man. Look at Hebrews 4, verses 12 and 13. Let's just see what it says. Here's why I start with the Word of God, and that's all I do. I just show, I share them the Word. Because the Word of God is living and active. Now look, you're, you're reading this. Word of God, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. It's Him in the flesh, and it's His Word. It's sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of the soul and of the spirit, of joints and marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. That's why we use the Word of God. Because that's the only thing that's going to change a man. Jesus Christ. The same. So here's the deal. Why didn't they believe? Why didn't these Pharisees, why, what should we do? What, what do we do about this? You know, we go back in John 11. What do we do? It's just really, I mean, it's hard to believe that they, they didn't believe. They've seen way more. This is just the last miracle they heard of. They weren't there. But they knew it had to be true because they've seen all the other ones. And it goes back to Luke 16, 31. I want you to put it up there again, Luke 16. Put it up there again. This is so important, y'all. If you don't hear Moses and the prophets, neither, neither will they become convinced if someone should rise from the dead. Y'all, it's so important for you and me not only to read the Word of God, but believe the Word of God. And there are some hard things in there for us to believe. And we're going to go through them some today. And it's probably going to offend some people. But that's okay. That's okay. See, these Pharisees, they could quote the Scripture. They taught, they taught it to people, right? That's what they did. That was their job. But they didn't understand it. Like, like Satan, he quotes Scripture. He knows it better than any of us combined. Combined, doesn't believe it, doesn't trust it, doesn't, no. So you can know the Bible, you can know these things, but if you don't understand, it's about understanding. This is why the New Testament talks about knowledge. It's why the Old Testament talks about knowledge of God. That's why, that's what the word theology is. It's important. Because this stuff's real. Let me, let me give you a statistic here. I had to look this one up. Four out of four people die. It's true. Four out of four die. And then you're face to face with God, and then there's no negotiating then. There's no bargaining. You have no bargaining power when you're, at that point. And here's what I'm going to say is going to be the same thing you say. If I'd only 
known how real it was, I'd have done more. That's what you're going to say. That's what I'm going to say. That's what everybody's going to say. Like, because we can believe, but man, oh my goodness. Y'all, I'm just telling you, you want to be a Christian, you really want to follow Christ, leverage everything you have for His kingdom. Advance His kingdom, because at the end of the day, nothing else matters. It really doesn't. It does not matter. Go back to John 11. Let's look at verse 47 through 48. It says, so the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered the council and said, what are we to do for this man performs many signs? And if, if we let them go on like this, everyone will believe in him and, and the Romans will come and, and take away both our place and our nation. So let's stop right there. Now, here's, again, so many times in Scripture when we don't have an understanding of God's Word and we don't have an understanding of some doctrine, we take phrases and we say, that's it. But this is one of those I want to just be very clear. You've got to read things in context. You have to have understanding. Here's a Pharisee. It says, if we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him. That's not saying literally every individual in the world will believe in him. You know? At another point, the Pharisee says, look, there goes Jesus. The whole world is following him. Well, when the Pharisee said that, he didn't literally mean every individual in the world is following Jesus, even though it says the whole world is following him. He said, man, there's a lot of people following him. Here, he doesn't really mean that everyone will believe in him because they don't believe in him. <laughs> like, they want to kill this man. So I just want to point that out. So we let him go on like this. Everyone will believe in him, and the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. These are the most religious people of the day here. These are the preachers and the teachers of the day. And what they really are are God-haters. Isn't that hard to believe? I mean, do you think that's out there today? I would assume so. That people put on the show, they quote these scriptures, they wear these nice, you know, preacher clothes, like me, my best. And listen, let's be honest. I want to be as fair as fair can be. Who took my water? I could be that guy. I could be a false teacher. I could be telling you things. You see what I'm saying? Tread lightly when people tell you the word of God. See, it's up to you to know God's word. This is why I put it up here so you can see it for yourself and like write it down, go read above it, below it. Bring your Bible. Know the word of God, y'all. So many people don't. And they just go to church and whatever their preacher says, they believe it. Because they trust Him. You see these people back here trusted, these religious leaders who said, you know, we're waiting on the Messiah. And do this, do this, do this, because that's what we're waiting on the Messiah to come. Here He is right here, and they want to kill the Messiah. Do y'all see how serious this is? Y'all, you've got to be creatures of the Word. The early church Christians, the called out ones is what they were known as, and they were known as creatures of the Word. Y'all, when Jesus says you can't live by bread alone, but by every word of God, that means not by bread alone, but every word of God. Not just a few verse here and a few verse there and verse there that backs up what you think you believe. Because remember last week we discussed that. A lot of people think they believe something, but when we start talking, they don't even believe what they think they believe. It starts going everywhere. And it's all because we don't know the word. We're not taught the word. So, I mean, that's a little... gets me fired up. You know, because I want us to know the word. I want people when they say, man, I go to the parish of the Redeemer or where do you go to church? Parish of the Redeemer. And they're like, dang, them people know the book. That's what I want people to say. They know the book. They take this stuff serious. They're always reading it and quoting it, you know, because there could be worse things. But these guys, they love teaching the word to people. They love telling people what to do. It just didn't apply to them, right? It didn't apply to them. And this is what people do. Like, put that verse up there again. I want to show you something. This is what people do. Look at verse 48. If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him, and the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. This is what people do when you don't really want to know their pure motives. I mean, what would it be like if, if, if these Pharisees just came out of the gate and said, look, guys, look, everybody huddle up. It's church, Sunday church. You know, everybody meets at the temple. I said, look, let's just be honest, y'all. I hate Jesus, and I want to kill him. I think they'd be like, somebody would be like, wait a second, isn't it wrong to murder? I mean... Isn't it, aren't we supposed to have, like, seek for justice and things like that? And there has to be, you know, like, two witnesses or more of some crime that is deserving of death. Like, 
Mr. Pharisee Joe, I don't think that we could do that. I think that's wrong. See, they can't come out and say that. And it's still true today. Like the religious leaders of today who are truly opposed to Christ, they can't come out and say these things. It's always something that's really not. See, to them, to these Pharisees, you know what it is? I mean, look, 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 it's, 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 look, I mean our place, the temple. I mean, we've got to preserve that. I mean, if, if, if we keep going on like this, then more people are going to follow Him and then and they're going to think that He's really, really the Messiah. And, they're going to want to overthrow Rome, and that's not going to work out well. And, and I mean, we're doing this for your benefit, y'all. We've got to look out for you. We're fearful of Rome. But when the Pharisees and religious leaders should be fear of who? Who should they really be fearful of? God. God. But they're fearful of Rome. See, it's never what it truly is. Really, at the end of the day, what is this right here? This is what it was. That little section right there, everyone will believe in Him. Because see, religious people have positions of power. They want people to follow them. They want to be the, the crescendo of everybody's life. Come to me for all your issues. You know, I will handle it. You know, oh, I will teach you. I will teach you. And I will do this. And see, they get mad if they start following somebody else because it takes away their power, their position, their titles. Because if they really understood what Jesus was talking about, we don't even need this stuff no more like that. We're not going to need this temple anymore. But we've got to protect our place. You see what I'm saying? That's the true intentions. And nobody really wants to tell you the true intentions. So they feared Rome more than God. They feared losing their positions of power more than God. They feared losing their temple, their place, more than God. Look at verses 49 and 50. But one of them, one of them, Caiaphas, who was a Sadducee, okay? So you got these Pharisees saying this, and you got Caiaphas, which is pretty neat. I don't want to go into detail about how he got there but his father-in-law was also high priest at this time when there's supposed to be a lifelong position. But it's been so jacked up, this whole Judaism system just keeps on crumbling as, as we go through history, that now, I mean, they have high priests every other year. You know what I'm saying? And at one time, you have Caiaphas and his, his father-in-law um, as high priest at the same time. But anyway, Caiaphas, who's a Sadducee, he was high priest that year. See, that year. He said to him. You know nothing at all. You know nothing. And he's saying this to these Pharisees, so you understand that Pharisees and Sadducees didn't get along. They disagreed on so many doctrinal things, right? You don't know nothing. Nor do you understand it's better for you that one man should die for the people, not that the whole nation should perish. So here's the Sadducee getting on these Pharisees, talking to them like they're little dogs. So you don't know nothing. You don't understand anything. And then he tells them this story. Look, it's better, it's better if it happens this way. If one man dies for the nation, then the whole nation die. Here's what's true still today. You have Pharisees and Sadducees. They can't stand each other. They're always fighting within themselves about their own doctrinal positions. But the one thing they can agree on is they both hate Jesus Christ. They both hate Jesus and so what does that tell us today? See, we're no different. There's people today, you have religions that completely disagree with each other on so many doctrinal issues. But the one thing they will agree on is some of these doctrines of God. And they will team up and they hate it. It's still true today. Look at verse 49 and 50 again. One of them, Caiaphas, high priest. He said, you know nothing, nor... Do you understand this better for you that one man should die for the people, not the whole nation should perish? So here's what he did. He just took off his, his priestly hat and he becomes a politician, right? Where the ends will justify the means. Like no longer am I going to look for justice and for the things of God. No longer am I going to fear God. We're going to make it about something else because we got to protect our own interest. So the ends, whatever we're wanting to do, is going to justify whatever means we have to do to get there, right? This is what... Politics does today. Start rationalizing your, your actions because you know it's wrong, right? Let me tell you something. Whenever you start justifying what you're about to do or what you've done, that should be a red flag to me, to you. When I do that, that was wrong. Like, when, just to make it like, give you an extreme so you understand what I'm talking about, I always say this, like, you never hear of a lady coming to you and saying, you know, I'm, I'm pregnant. I'm pregnant. 
I mean, because my husband, I mean, we love each other and, and we love each other. We've been, we've been married two years and, and we've always wanted a baby. See, they don't do that. They just say, I'm pregnant. And we're like, oh, yes, that's awesome, right? There's no justifying that. But now you have someone come and says, look, I'm pregnant and I'm going to have an abortion because, da 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 So you start justifying, right? And they just, we don't want to listen. When we want to do what we want to do, when we take our eyes like Caiaphas off of God, when we take our eyes off Christ and we put it to our own desires, y'all, it never ends well. It never ends well. And so when we talk to people in these positions, yes, there's grace and forgiveness for that and for every sin in the world. But y'all, we got to be people of God who stand up to try to protect and love our neighbors ourselves and say, listen, I understand you're scared. I understand you're, you're worried to death. But I'm telling you, look to Christ. Do not look to yourself because when you do this, I'm telling you, it's going to eat you alive. And it'll, it, you'll run. And it will not end well. Do you understand that? But we always justify things that we know are wrong because we try to convince ourselves. This is what he's doing. But let's just give Caiaphas the benefit of the doubt, okay? Let's just say he sincerely and genuinely does care for the people of Israel and for being good subjects to Rome. He's sincere, genuinely. He really does care about Israel and the Jewish people. And he really does want to protect the holy temple of God. And he's sincere and genuine. You know what Bodie Bauckham says? I think I have this up here. Do I not? If I don't, Bodhi Bakum is just a good one. You can sincerely believe a false gospel. It just means you're sincerely wrong. You can sincerely believe it. Sincerely with all of your heart. It just means you're sincerely wrong. And when you add anything to Christ, that's a false gospel. And it's a very serious issue. Read Galatians 1. See, Caiaphas' plan was to kill Christ so they could protect themselves from Rome. And so Rome would see how loyal they are to them. Remember, eventually you hear this, we have no king but Caesar. Crucify him, right? The plan came true. So in his mind, he was like, here's what we got to do, guys. Let's just, let's just get brass tacks. we got to kill him. It's better for him to die than the whole nation die. So we can protect ourselves from Rome and keep our positions of power. But the funny thing is, the funny thing is, this is what happens when we take our eyes off Christ and we look to ourselves. It never ends well. Do you realize, because he did what he did, because of that statement, he's like, let's do this. Let's kill Christ to protect everybody else and to protect the temple. Do you realize less than 40 years later, because of the wrath of God who killed their Messiah, Less than 40 years later, Rome comes to Jerusalem, completely destroys it and levels the city in A.D. 70 and tears the temple completely to pieces where there's not one stone left on top of the other now. You can go stand on the rubble today. So the thing that he was trying to protect because of his actions, it brought the absolute opposite of what he was wanting because he thought he was doing something. But look at verses 51 and 52. It says, he didn't say this of his own accord. But being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the nation. He prophesied. He had no clue. This man hated Jesus. He prophesied that Jesus would die for the nation and not for the nation only, but also to gather into one, what? The children of God who were scattered abroad. He had no idea God was using him. None. No clue. And that's us today. That's, that's, that's everybody Y'all, we think that we're just doing our thing. God's a sovereign God. He is in control. He is not out of control. He is in control. Caiaphas meant one thing by his words, but God meant another. And there's many scriptures that will point to this. I'm going to show you just a few. We can stay here for hours. If you want more later, we can study more. I love it. But look at Proverbs 19.21. Proverbs 19.21. Many are the plans in the mind of a man, Caiaphas. But it is the purpose of the Lord that will stand. You might think you're going to do this X, Y, or Z. Let me tell you something. You're going to do what God allows and wants. That's what's going to happen. See, this is the, what's called the doctrine of the sovereignty of God. 
And see, this is one of those things we talked about last week that, you know, we say we believe something, but the question is, do we really believe it? See, do you hear the words of Moses and the prophets? Do you understand what you're committing yourself to, Martha, when you say, yes, I believe you're the resurrection, and then all of a sudden, rubber meets the road, she's like, no, don't, don't open the tomb because she's been dead four days. But Martha, you said you believed I was the resurrection. See, everybody says that God's sovereign in control of everything, Right? But then we start getting into some issues. They're like, no, 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 not that. Now, he's not in control of that. That's up to you. That's up to me. That's up to, that's just the way the weather works. So he's not in control of everything. See, you, you see how it, it starts playing out? This is the doctrine of the sovereignty of God. And there's things that happen in our life that we might not understand, we might not like. We might be questioning so much, but the one thing you don't question is God's holy word. That's the only place you can find answers. That's the only place you can find comfort. And let me tell you something. If you don't have a God in control of everything, what's the point? You ever heard that by people? Why pray? If God's in control of everything, why pray? The question is, why pray if He's not? What's He going to do? He's not in control of nothing. What can He do? Nothing. You know, you, you want a sovereign God, and when you finally wrap your mind around who God is and who you really are, a wretched, sinful person like me, maybe not as bad as me, but you're wretched, and you're a sinful, wretched person. When you wrap your mind around a God who is sovereign in control of everything, and you realize that all of these things are working out, whoo, it's a warm blanket for your soul, right? Isn't that what Matt Chandler said? Such a good, it's a warm blanket for your soul. Let me tell you something. If God Almighty is willing to put His Son to death on a cross... And if he had a plan for that, I promise you whatever you're going through, whatever I'm going through, God has a plan for that as well. He doesn't waste things. He is working. He is God. And you have to believe his word. Hear his word. Understand it. Don't just say it. Only a God who is sovereign in control of everything can say this right here in Romans chapter 8, 28. Put it up there. Romans 8, 28. Write it down. Look it up later. Watch it right here. Only a God who is in control of everything and control a sovereign God can say, we know that for those who love God, all things, not some things, a lot of things, most things, but all things work for good. Maybe not you're good at the time. You might not think it's good. But what's this all about? What's the man's primary purpose? To glorify God, enjoy Him forever? Not to glorify me. It's for His good. It's for the good. For good. All things work together for good. For those who are called according to His purpose. And you know why He can make that promise. Let me just tell you why He can make that promise. Because of Ephesians 1.11. Because He's in control of everything. In Him, we have obtained an inheritance having been predestined according to the purpose of Him who works what? Push it again. All things according to what? the counsel of His will. Y'all, God is sovereign in control of everything. He works all things according to the counsel of His will. Caiaphas spoke a prophecy thinking he's talking about saving Israel in the temple, but God said, no, 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 no. See, I made you say that because I have... I meant something else by it, Caiaphas. I meant something else. Charles Spurgeon quote, look at this. No doctrine in the whole Word of God has more excited the hatred of mankind than the truth of the absolute sovereignty of God. The fact that the Lord reigneth is indisputable, and it is the fact that arouses the utmost opposition in the unrenewed human heart. This, my friends, y'all, has always been and will always be the doctrine that we'll see you make some sparks fly. But I hope and I pray that you and I both stand on the sovereignty of God and trust Him that He's doing something good for His good, for His kingdom, for His people. And we don't trust ourselves because it's not about us, it's about Him. And we rest in His goodness and His gracious. The question is, do you trust the sovereign God? Do you trust Him? Do you trust that He's good? Trust Him. Believe His word. Caiaphas thought his plan was a good one. The whole time it was God's plan. Check this out. Remember Joseph and his brothers? Joseph and his brothers, I'm going to tell you real quick before you put anything up there. Joseph, coat of many colors. You know, if dad would have gave him a black coat, 
no big deal, right? But it just so happened, God got lucky, and his dad gave him a coat of many colors, and then things started working out. That, see, there's no coincidence. God was in control of what even coat he got. It was the coat of many colors, what that represented that made his brothers jealous. And so they were like jealous. They want to kill him. They send him off. He goes. He ends up being the second man in charge of Egypt. His brothers come. I mean, I'll just condense that one down, right? Just read Genesis 49, 50. His brothers come. They realize, oh my goodness, this is Joseph who we were trying to kill. And now he's the second one in charge of Egypt. He's going to kill us, you would think, because that's what you would do. See? You always view others the way you view yourself. Because I'd kill you if you did that to me, Joseph. And he said, you, they're going to kill us. But what is... See, Jesus remembered this because he wrote it. He was in control of it the whole time. God's not a lucky God. Things didn't just work out for him. He's marching through history. It's his history. He's God. But I, can, I, remember, I think of Jesus thinking of this story. And if Jesus had Twitter at this time when, Je, when, when Caiaphas said, hey, here's what we're going to do. We're going to kill him on behalf of the people so we can preserve our stuff. And it's better for one man to die than the whole people to die. And I can remember, look, look think about this. Jesus, I'll put this up here. I worked hard on this one, y'all. Put this up here. It's a, it's a little tweet Jesus sent Caiaphas. Verse of the day, Caiaphas. Genesis 50, 20. As for you, you meant evil against me. But God meant it for good. He didn't turn it into something good. No, He meant it for something good. To bring about that many should be kept alive as they are today. Y'all, every verse in the Bible, every story is about Jesus Christ. Find Him. Read it slowly and find Him. That right there, you might be thinking it's about Joseph. No, it's about Christ. You see, one day, that's all all the way back in Genesis. One day, God's saying, one day you're going to hear something like this. Keep your ears open. Know, hear, understand the Word of God so when it comes, you'll know. As for you, you men evil, brothers, You meant evil, Caiaphas, against me. But God meant it for good. Think about that. He meant it. He's in control. Here's a good one. Who killed Jesus? Who killed Jesus? I I just want to tell you, you, I want you to see God's Word, that He is sovereign in control of everything. And when we say everything, we mean everything. We don't mean everything but this, this, and this. Everything. So think to yourself, who killed Jesus? Who really did it? Well, you might be thinking, I don't know, Herod? He had a hand in it. Herod did. Pilate had a hand in it. The Gentiles, the Roman soldiers, they had a hand in it. The Jews, they had a hand in it. You're right. And they wanted to kill Him. They wanted to. And they did. But that wasn't my question, who had a hand in it. See, who raised Lazarus from the dead? Everybody says Jesus. Nobody says, well, the the people who moved the stone, they... They actually did, because he, they played a part. But Jesus didn't need them to play a part. He, he, wanted, he invited them, remember? He invited them to play a part. Who, so who really killed Jesus? Look in Acts 4, 27 through 28. Write this down, look it up here, read it in your own Bible. For truly in this city, there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod, see, he had a part in it, Pontius Pilate, he had a part, along with the Gentiles, the Roman soldiers played a part, and the people of Israel, to do what? Hit it. Go to the next verse. To do whatever your hand, God, and your plan had predestined to take place. See, they were instruments that God used to do what He wanted to do. They had a hand in it, no doubt. But at the end of the day, who killed Christ? God Almighty. Used these men to do what His hand and His plan had predestined to take place. Look at it, read it, believe it, hear it, try to understand it. Because it ain't going to change. Isaiah 53.10 says this, Yet it was the will of the Lord to what? Crush Him. He has what? Put Him to grief. He, the Lord, crushed Him. So let me tell you something. Again, whatever you're going through, It isn't for no reason. It's for His glory. Because God is a jealous God. Trust Him in whatever it is that you or I am going through. Trust Him. Because if He's willing to do that to His Son in order to bring about what He's done, I promise you, He might be willing to do something with us that we might be fearful of. That we might not get. 
trust and believe and understand God's word. Back to John eleven fifty one through 52. It says, He didn't say this of His own accord, but being high priest that year, He prophesied that Jesus would die for the nation and not for the nation only, but also to gather into, to gather into one the children of God who were scattered abroad. It says, Jesus would die for the nation. Israel, Jews. Okay? Israel, the Jews. Also, so He's going to die for that. This is what the prophecy really meant. Also, to gather into one the children of God who are scattered abroad, Gentiles all over the world, the elect, God's people. Do you remember just before this, this is John 10, right? I mean, this is John 11. When we read the Bible, we can't forget where we came from in John 10, where Jesus says, I lay down my life for my sheep, and I have other sheep that are not of this fold, and when I call them, they come because they know my voice. And he looks at one person and he says, but you don't believe because you're not one of my sheep. He doesn't say, you're not one of my sheep, Because you don't believe. He said you don't believe because you're not one of my sheep. See, Christ come not to die on a cross for an opportunity for people. He did not die for an opportunity. He died to pay a price for His people and for the people of God scattered all over the world that are His. He came and He paid death for them. And He ransomed them. And He purchased them. And they're His now. And he will get everything he paid for. Just like you get your shoes when you buy your little shoes for 60 bucks and I get my little shoes for 60 bucks. You think God ain't going to get what he paid for with his son? I promise you he's going to get it. Now you can run from him all you want, but if he wants you, he's going to get you. I would suggest bow the knee to the king right now. Repent of your sins and bow your face before the king of kings and lord of lords now. Otherwise, he might make it a little bit more painful. But he'll get you. The king is coming. There's no negotiating. So let me just give you a a few things here. See, when you think he died for an opportunity for people, you're minimizing the death of Christ. It was, it was somewhat in vain, right? Because he wanted everybody. But I guess his love and his kindness and his grace wasn't enough to convince him. He just didn't do enough. Oh, no, no. See, don't minimize the death of Christ. It's called the doctrine of the atonement. It's Romans 5. Christ died for his people. Let me just give you a few verses again. We want to do this some other time. Let's, let's get with me. We'll do it for hours and hours. Don't want to take too much. So I'm going to give you a few verses here in 1 Thessalonians 5, 9 through 10. For God has not destined us, us, who's he writing to? Who's the us? These Christians in Thessalonica. He's not destined us for wrath. Now, what's the point if he's destined nobody to wrath? What was the point of saying that? He's not destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us that whether we are awake or asleep, we might live with Him. This is, look, this is, this is John 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, and 11. It's in every chapter. Clear as a bell. Read slowly. Try to understand. Isaiah 53, 8. Here's the prophecy of what God's going to do. Christ. By oppression and judgment, He was taken away. And as for His generation, who considered that He was cut off of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of My people? Not of whoever. No, of my people. God's people. Matthew 1.21. When Jesus, we talked about this at Christmas. Jesus is coming into the world. Matthew 1.21. He, she will bear a son and you shall call his name Jesus for he will save his people from their sins. He's coming for his people. John 10. I'm coming for my sheep and I die for my sheep and I'm going to get all of them. John 10, 26. Let me just end with it. I've been saying it. But you do not believe because why? You're not one of my sheep. See, my sheep hear my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me. Hit that button again so they can see that. My Father who has given them to me. See, that's what we are. We're a gift to the Son. We're just a gift to Him. That's John 6. God has given us to Him. Thank God Almighty. Thank God Almighty that He chose a wretched, simple person like me that opened my eyes. Now I know that I'm no better than anyone out there in the world. So I pray that God opens their heart and eyes. Because if He wouldn't have done it for me or you, we'd be worse. 
My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and the Father are one. Back to John 11, verse 53. So after Caiaphas prophesies this, from that day on they made plans to put him to death. They were like, that's a great one. That's a good one. Let's do that. It's crazy. But it was God's will. Verse 54 says this, Jesus therefore no longer walked openly among the Jews, but went from there to the region near the wilderness to a town called Ephraim, and there he stayed with the disciples. So what we can learn from this is like we just, you know, sometimes you just need to avoid trouble. I mean, if you know it's there, don't just run into it. Sometimes it's good just to walk away, right? That's what Jesus did here. Ephraim was a town in the Old Testament where the, the apostate went, the ones who rejected the really bad ones, the ones who had turned away and didn't eat. That that's who we are before we come to Christ. And before he comes to us, we had turned away from God. And he comes to us, right? So that's the little thing about a frame. I'm going a little long, so I'm going to speed that up. Now, verse 55, it says, Now the Passover of the Jews was at hand, and many went up from the country to Jerusalem before the Passover to purify themselves. Imagine this, y'all. They know what's going on. They know the Pharisees are wanting to kill him. They, they, some of these people are the ones who told on him. But what do they do? Oh, it's, it's Sunday. Let's go to church. Let's put on our religious stuff. I mean, they know what's about to go down. They're playing a part in it, some of them. But they want to go do the purification festivals and rituals and play religion. Y'all, let's not play religion. Let's not do that. It never ends well. Look. Verse 56 through 57. Our last two. They were looking for Jesus and saying to one another as they stood in the temple, what do you think? They'll come to the feast at all? Or? Now the chief priests and the Pharisees had given orders that if anyone knew where he was, he should let them know so that they might arrest him. So see, they went down here, they went to do their little religious festivals and, and their purifications. Inwardly, they didn't care what people thought inwardly of them, but outwardly, oh, we're good. No, you're not. Inwardly, you're murderers. You're God-haters. We have to be people that look in our heart, y'all, and not fear of man, but fear of God. These people fear Rome instead of fearing God. we got to fear God more than man. Not play the religious game, but think about this. Think about the buzz, right? The buzz when they were all down there doing their little purifications. What do you think? Think He's coming? I don't know. I mean, if it was me, I'd be like, I wouldn't come. They know. I mean, dude, he knows that they're wanting to kill him. I wouldn't come. Would you come? And, you know, there's, you know, there's always a John Wayne in the group. He's like, I'll come. I ain't scared of nothing. You know? Like, shut up. You wouldn't come. You'd be the first one leaving. I mean, they're all talking, they're buzzing, they're like, man, what's, what's going to happen? We just want to see the drama. And they probably don't really even care one way or the other. They just want to know, they just want to see what's going to go down. I mean, they don't really have a, nah, they're just playing the game, right? They don't care about what's really in here. They don't really care about the, like the, the faith and the, the religious customs and the doctrines of God are not truly you know, consequential to them. It's, it doesn't really matter, but they play the game. So they just want to see some drama. Hmm. But the question is, what do you think, right? That's the good question. The good question is what they ask. What do you think? What do you think about Jesus? So here's my question for you. And we'll, we'll end it right now. What do you think? You want to be, are you, do you think you're like the Pharisees and the high priest, the Sadducee, who, you know, just, you really hate Jesus. You really hate God. Just the thought of it. Like surrendering everything to Him. I'm not doing that. I mean, I know he wants that. I'm not doing that. See, that's what they really struggled with. They didn't want to lose their power and give it all to him. Is it one of those things you just don't want to surrender? That's the thing with the Pharisees and the Sadducees. They didn't want to give up everything to follow him. They didn't want to count the cost to follow him. It's going to cost you everything, but it costs you nothing. It's the really crazy thing here. It costs you everything, but it costs you nothing. Are you willing for that? Are you willing to pay that price? Are you like them? Because if you are, I'm just going to tell you right now, it doesn't end well. God is sovereign. The king, Luke 4, the king is coming. You see him in the distance coming. You know his army is greater than yours. What are you going to do? Are you going to be dumb enough to go up against him? It ain't going to end well. Surrender everything right now. Don't be like them. Or are you like these people who are doing their purification washings? You do the, you know, you're not, you're not coming out, you're not planning to kill Jesus. I mean, you're not the one drawing up the game plan to kill Jesus Christ. But, you're playing a part, right? Because you're, 
you might go and tell them. You might be one of those. You're one of those that that maybe just, it's not consequential. The faith isn't really consequential. You just check the box. You come on Sundays. Don't do that. I want to look for one couple things. Don't do it. I wouldn't do it. I go play golf, right? Go play golf, sleep in. Don't get in a fight with your wife about what shoes the kids got on, like because it's just getting to church early. Just just don't do that, y'all. It doesn't end well there either. If you're going to follow Christ, the only option is just follow Him. Submit to Him. Know His Word. Study His Word. Get to know His Word and, and try to advance His kingdom. Advance His kingdom. Let people know that the King of Kings is sitting on a throne right now and He rules heaven and earth. And you better bow your knee and submit to Him. It's not a question. It's a command. We've heard that before. We're not asking people. He's not a beggar. And He's not begging someone to give Him their heart. He is a king. And kings don't beg anybody. Kings send their people out and they announce who the king is and they tell people, submit now because there's a new king on the throne. And that's what we have to do and tell people to do that. And so I pray if you've never done that today, submit, bow your knee to King Jesus, repent of your sins, come to know Christ and live. Trust him and his promises. He's good, y'all. Trust the king. We're Americans. We hate kings. You know what I'm saying? We like voting people in, voting people out. That makes sense to us. Because if I don't like him, I'm out. You're out. We're voting you out. We flew a flag in the Revolutionary War. It says we bow to no king. We bow to no sovereign. See, we hate kings. Because we don't trust them. But you can trust this one. He's good. He's gracious. He's wrathful. And he's just. Trust him. Let me pray. Father God, come to you. In the name of Jesus Christ, Father God, I thank you for this day again, for being able to allow to Preach Your Word. Teach Your Word, God. Thank You for giving me the opportunity to study Your Word, Father. And Lord, I pray that You prick my heart in this message, Lord, that I trust You more because I fail You every day when I look to my own interests and I look away from You because I want to do what I want to do like Caiaphas and the Pharisees did, Father. Lord, I pray You forgive me. God, I pray You forgive all of us here because we all do the same thing, Lord. We're sinful people and without Christ, we are nothing. Without the Holy Spirit living and dwelling in us, God, conforming us more into the image of Christ, Lord, we will fail. And so we need you every hour, Father. Every minute, every breath. And I pray that if someone doesn't know you and know your son, God, I pray you call them to yourself this morning. It's in Christ's name I pray, amen.